We'll be starting in verse 17 today. Acts chapter 5, 17. Notice the title of the sermon today. Normally I don't talk about the title of the sermon. I kind of almost put it there because I'm expected to. But today I want to talk about the title. Haters continue to hate. God continues to build. Who are the haters? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the priests, all those folks. The religious elite, those, those are the haters. And haters continue to hate. God continues to build. What's he building? He's building the apostles, and he's building his church. So this is kind of a theme that we're, we're seeing in Acts. It's, it's, it's coming up over and over again. It's showing itself to be true. Haters continue to hate. God continues to build. So three things in your notes to start with. In this passage, we will see the church being strengthened. Every time we, we, we cover a passage so far, the church is strengthened, the church is born, the church is built, the church learns a lesson, the church is strengthened. Today, it's going to be strengthened through, prosec- through, through persecution. It's, it's a kind of a new, a new thing for them. They're actually going to be persecuted in, in a large extent. But the church is being strengthened through trials and obedience. Number two, the apostles are becoming even more courageous and committed to their task. They're becoming more courageous. They're they're speaking more often. They're probably speaking more boldly. They're committed to their task. They're not backing down. We're going to see that happening. And number three, God's will is being accomplished despite opposition and persecution. Okay, despite opposition and persecution. And, and I want those things to be said at the beginning because I ho- hope you realize that I could have been talking about the world today. In the world today, the church is being strengthened. Do you know the church in China is being strengthened and it's illegal there? Do you know there's a church in, I- in Iraq and Iran that is being strengthened and it's illegal there? There's a church in Afghanistan that's under direct attack right now physical attack right now, and it's being strengthened. And there's a church in America that is experiencing things we haven't experienced before, maybe the beginning of greater persecution, but we're being strengthened. The churches I'm aware of, the churches that we associate with, became stronger through the first wave and the second wave and the third wave of COVID and and the restrictions and the mandates and all these things became stronger. It was predicted we would all crumble. It was predicted we'd all go broke and that we would have to shut our doors and that we would cease to exist. That was predicted in the media. It was predicted online, but the opposite happened. Churches were strengthened. Believers were strengthened. So the church is being strengthened today, pretty much no matter where it exists. And the conditions vary dramatically depending on where it does exist. The apostles are becoming even more courageous and committed to their task. We don't have apostles today, but we have pastors and teachers and evangelists, and and we are becoming more committed to our task. Your Sunday school teachers and your Awana leaders and your child care workers are becoming more committed to their task. Those who, who help the church in fellowship and those who meet other people's needs are becoming more committed to the task. So the church is being strengthened. The believers and and leaders are becoming more courageous and more committed to their task. I I see that happening. It's been happening for a while. I predict it will continue to happen, no matter what comes at us or, or for us. And number three, God's will is being accomplished despite opposition and persecution. They say one of the largest churches is in China, where it's pretty much illegal. The, uh, They've been talking about a, a, a quite significant church existing in Iraq right now, that it's a growing thing. We have missionaries going to Saudi Arabia. Apparently, the Islamic world is ripe for the gospel because Islam has failed them. Now they're looking for something else, and we need to be there with the gospel, or they'll just assume there is no God. So we see this happening today. It has always happened this way. It happened when the Romans were in charge. It happened in the Dark Ages, even though they were dark. There were people representing God. There were people proclaiming the truth. That's where we get the Reformation from, right out of that era of time. It, It has always happened this way. 
And it will always happen this way, and we can be assured it's happening that way right now. So when you feel like it's not working, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like, well, it's, it's time to stop praying for new families, and it's time to stop, stop praying for the missing. We just need to gather together, close the doors, have a holy huddle, and, and just survive together. When you feel like that, and you might feel like that because of things going on around you and in the world and even in your own families, when you feel like that, rest assured that the church is being strengthened, that leaders and those around you are more courageous and more committed than they have been before, and you can follow them, and God's will will be accomplished despite what goes on. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what a dictator does. It doesn't matter what a terrorist does. It doesn't matter what a president or a congressman or a councilman or a teacher or a parent or a rotten teenager. It doesn't matter what anybody does. God's will will be accomplished. That's good news. That's almost worth the whole sermon right there. That's good news. But we're going to look at Acts 5, 17 through 41. It's a really long passage, 42. We're going to read it. Then we're going to come back and we're going to pull some things out of it. So let's read it together. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used... Excuse me. I've been reading the wrong verse. Let's start in verse 17. I'm like, that sounds like last week's sermon. Okay, verse 17. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, this would be at the temple, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, to, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the disciples. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We, have, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgiveness of their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, the Sanhedrin, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God." His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. 
the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's, that's our text. It's, it's a pretty straightforward story. I think we understand what happened. What I want to do, in your notes I call them delightful details. Sometimes we just need to pick out the small things in the story, ask ourselves what can we learn from them. So we've got seven details I want to pull out of this narrative, and I want us to talk about them. The first one is from verse 17. Verse 17 says, Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So in your notes, the Sadducees were jealous. They were jealous. Now, notice they weren't reacting in, in, in righteous anger. They weren't angry at the apostles because of the righteousness within their heart. It wasn't holiness they were seeking. Uh, they were not zealously defending God and zealously devoted to God. They were jealous. See the difference? As leaders of the church, as leaders of the people, religiously, they should have been concerned about what God wanted and what God was doing and what God was instructing, but they weren't into that. They were into protecting themselves. They were jealous. Why were they jealous? Well, A, in your notes, the people were not listening to them. They were not validating them, and they weren't following them as before. Thousands of people at this time, at least 5,000 men, plus many members of their families, and that was a while back, so even more now, thousands of people that used to clamor at the feet of the Sadducees and clamor at the feet of the priest, looking for approval, looking for instruction, doing whatever they said, and, and really honoring them and lifting them up to a position that they were very comfortable with, all of a sudden, thousands of people that used to do this were no longer doing this. They were walking past them to go hear what the apostles had to say. They were asking the apostles probably, oh, what do you think about this? The apostles were teaching different things. They, they no longer got the prestige they were looking for. They no longer had the power and authority and persuasion they used to have. What's really happening is B, their eyes were on themselves, not their ministry, and not on God. They were looking at themselves. They were seeing how this movement was affecting them. They weren't asking God if it was his movement. They weren't asking God if he was in it. They were just looking at how it was affecting them, and they were jealous. They were probably losing money. They were definitely losing power and position. They were jealous. So here's a warning for you. Too much emphasis on me and my list of wants can cause me to totally miss out on what God is doing right in front of me. Right in front of me. Do you realize that these people had a front row seat to Jesus' crucifixion? They saw the sky turn black. They saw or heard about people rising from the dead. They experienced by seeing it in the after effect the veil torn from top to bottom. They were in the controversy over where did the body go. They tried to cover it up, but it was gone. They knew it was gone. They saw Jesus and heard Jesus resurrected, walking around town, talking to people, teaching. They knew about the ascension. Then they knew all about Pentecost, the, the gift of languages, the, the miracle of languages. They knew all about that. They had seen and heard all of it. It was happening right in front of them, before their very eyes, but they didn't want to see it. They were so concerned about their life, what they had built, what they wanted to maintain, that the only emotion they had was jealousy. So that's who the enemy is. That's the haters here. The people that were jealous of what was happening, who should have been the first to say, wow, this is God. This is exactly what the Messiah is supposed to do. It makes so much sense now. We can see it in Scripture. Let's all get on board and follow. That's, they should have been leading the way. But they weren't. So jealousy can get in the way, and having my eyes too much on me can get in the way. That's detail number one. Detail number two is from Acts 5, 18 and 23. 18 says they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Then 23 says, 
We found the jail securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Uh, in your notes, the angels released them without anyone knowing about it. You see the miracle there? They were in jail. They were in a cell with a door. Now you can picture different kinds of jails, different kinds of things. They were in an enclosed room with a door that was designed to be locked so they couldn't get out. That would normally be enough. But there was also two guards at least standing outside the door. Two guards who were on duty, and if they failed in their duty, it would, it would be the death penalty for them. They took their job very seriously. So there's, there's a safe room, there's a door, there's two guards. The angel came in, opened the door, and they walked out. Now, we don't know if it was all the apostles or some of the apostles, but there was enough apostles that there was a little parade that came out through the door. Uh, it wasn't one guy sneaking around. It was a string of people coming out the door, walked right, right through the door, right in front of, behind, around the guards, whatever the situation was, and exited the building, and then went to the temple to start preaching. And nobody saw a thing. Nobody noticed a thing. In the morning, while they're preaching, the Sanhedrin is gathering. They send the orders. Go bring the people we arrested. They go, they go to the jail. While they're preaching, they go to the jail. They come and go, hey, we need the guys. All right, let's unlock the door. They unlock the door. They open it. They go inside. Oh, there's nobody here. What do you mean there's nobody here? Was the door locked? Yeah, the door was locked. Weren't you here all night? Absolutely, I was here all night. Not, not a doubt. Nothing got by me except all the people that were in the jail cell. So a, a miracle took place. Nobody knew about it. And, and you might just think God did that because it's cool, right? Maybe God just wanted to have some fun with these people. It's like, yeah, go ahead, rest, rest my guys. See how that works out. Ha ha, they're not here. But I think there was more to it than that. I think there's something to notice here. Um, and your notes, if the doors were left unlocked and opened, it would have been considered an escape. And let's, let's stop there. If, if the guards had been knocked out or, or, or fallen asleep or something and the door was open, the lock was jimmied, if, if somehow there was evidence that they had been broken out, the reaction would have been quite different. The first person to notice it would have sounded an alarm. They, they would go out searching for them. The orders would have been find them, get them back under all circumstances, maybe even um, dead or alive, who knows. But in, back to your notes, an escape would have triggered a manhood situation, probably leading to violence. And violence was not what God was looking for. He was looking for faithful men to preach in the temple. So B, a locked and closed doors with undisturbed guards left only the miraculous. There's only one conclusion. The guards are on duty. They haven't left their post. The door is still locked. It only leaves one option. A miracle took place. These guys who have been known for miracles miraculously left the jail. More evidence of God's power, more evidence of what God's doing. And the miracle of them being released in this way forced cooler heads and a quiet rearrest. You, you, did you catch they were rearrested? They found them in the temple preaching and they got them. But it said, it said in verse 26, they did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. So they had to rearrest them, and they weren't going to run in and go, hey, you guys, that's a dirty trick using God's power to get out of jail. Uh, we're really mad now, and you're going to pay for this. The people would have been, what? God let them out of jail? No way. And do you think the apostles who had all been publicly arrested the night before weren't standing there going, yeah, 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 we were just, yeah, an angel came, let us out. Now, we've got to tell you about Jesus. No, no, tell us about the jailbreak. No, we didn't, an angel let us out. We didn't do anything. So everyone knew what was happening, and it forced a, a very quiet arrest. Also notice, the apostles didn't put up a fight. They just went with them. It says the apostles were brought and made to appear. At this point in time, they could have rallied the troops. It says the, the people in charge were, fear, were afraid they would be stoned if they came in with force. So this is what happened. God protected them, 
And the, the method he chose protected them further. So he got them out of jail, and then he protected them for what he had for them. That's detail number two. Detail number three is 5, 26, and 27. We're just continuing on. Verse 26 is, At that the captain of the guard went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priests. What I want you to notice now is that the Sanhedrin feared the people. The Sanhedrin feared the people. They were afraid the people would stone them. But the apostles did not fear the Sanhedrin. The apostles are like, yeah, we'll go. Yeah, obviously these people are ready to defend us, but no problem, we'll go. The Sanhedrin were afraid, the apostles were not. Why? A, the Sanhedrin altered their plans in fear because they had no assurance or even hope that God would protect them as they served him. One, because they weren't serving God. Remember, they're jealous. They're not defending God. They're not, there's no righteous anger. There's no zealousy for God. They're not defending God's honor. They're defending their honor. They're defending their interests. And when they have all that going on and, and no one's, no one is looking at them now as on God's side, at least in this group. And they're not even calling on God. They're in fear. Because their experience for the last three years is that whenever they encounter this guy or his people, God's on their side. So they're not willing to take a chance. They don't have God on their team. God's not protecting them. The apostles, however, boldly kept on task because they were obeying direct orders from God and put their future into his hands. You see the mindset here? Okay, we, we actually have direct orders from God. We know exactly what we're supposed to do. And we're going to do it because God will protect us until we're done doing what he's asked us to do. And then he can do with us as he pleases. They weren't afraid of being arrested and being put in jail. They weren't afraid of being arrested and being taken before the Sanhedrin because they knew that God had a plan. He had given them instructions. And they were simply following it. So it was in God's hands. Would they be executed? Well, if they were, that would be part of God's plan. They were okay with that. Would they be beaten and flogged, which they ended up being part of God's plan? Would they be released? Part of God's plan. It was all in his hands. So the Sanhedrin had fear because they were self-serving, they were jealous, and they weren't under God's protection. The apostles did not have fear because they were serving God first and were under his protection. Let's translate that to today. When we're serving God, obeying his instructions, we're under his protection. That doesn't mean that nothing bad's going to happen. Probably means bad things will happen because God uses bad things. God even uses enemies, which is what we're going to see next in a minute. Number four, before we get there, the fourth fact, Acts 5, 29 through 32 It says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Kind of like we've already told you this. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, uh, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Notice they threw that in there because they just said, you're trying to make us feel guilty. You're trying to make us guilty of his death. Well, you are. Verse 31, uh, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgiveness of sins. Uh, like uh, he's going to do the job you haven't done. So they're not backing down. They're kind of laying in. But you know what? It says, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. There's a little dig. You guys don't have the Holy Spirit? Oh, I guess you're not obeying him. But those of us who have the Holy Spirit, yeah, it's, he's verifying that we're doing the right thing. What I want you to notice is the message has not changed one bit. Every time they encounter these guys, they give them the same message. Every time they preach, they give the same message. Now, they probably talk about a lot of other things as well, but this part of the message doesn't change. Yeah, you put him on the cross, but it was part of God's plan. God raised him from the dead, and there was nothing you can do about it. And and Jesus is Lord, and he's Messiah, and he's got a new plan that you are more than welcome to join, but you're not going to stop. 
That's the message they keep saying. So they believe the gospel message so much that it was non-negotiable. I underline that. I bold-faced it. That's a word you need to learn. That's a word you need to use. Some things, matters of faith, need to be non-negotiable. You need to be able to look someone in the eye and go, actually, that's a non-negotiable for me. That's a line I won't cross. That's an activity I won't partake in. That's a message I will not send. Whatever the case may be, it, it goes along with your convictions. I have a conviction about that. This is non-negotiable. It's a great word. Non-negotiable sounds very official. This is non-negotiable. It's not open for discussion. We're not going to talk about it. This is what it is. This is where I stand. This is what God has told me. This is it. There's a line, there's a line drawn in the sand I'm not going to cross, so don't even bother trying to convince me. Non-negotiable. Learn the word. The gospel message to them was non-negotiable. It did not change. It didn't matter who they, who they spoke to. B, they did not cater the message to the audience. You know, they could have got out of a lot of trouble by softening it up a little bit. Well, guys, you, you, did, you did put Jesus on the cross. There's no way around that, but, but we understand. You were under a lot of pressure. There was a lot of confusion. You had the Romans breathing down your neck. You know, a lot has happened since then, and, and we should learn to work together. We should learn to be friends. So, so we'll back off a little bit, calling, calling you out like this, and, and you, you back off a little bit, arresting us. We'll learn to get along. It, it'll work out fine. Let's, let's just do this. They could have done that. Probably would have worked. But no, this is non-negotiable. You put him on the cross. It was God's plan, but you did it. He rose from the dead, whether you like it or not, and everybody knows it. He is God, he is the Messiah, and he is offering forgiveness of sin for Israel and everybody else. You're welcome to join us, but you can't stop us. We're going to preach. Non-negotiable. The message never changed. Now, Acts 5, 34 through 39, our fifth detail. And I won't read all of this. Just want to read part of it. But it says, uh, verse 34, But a Pharisee named Gamaliel a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the, San, in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, and he mentions these guys, and he says, hey, there was this guy, and it didn't work out. There was this guy, it didn't work out. They died. Everyone dispersed. Not a big deal. Verse 38. Therefore, in the present, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail, just like the others. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. This is really interesting because their lives, number five, their lives and ministries were saved by a Pharisee. Did you catch that? Their lives and ministries were saved by a Pharisee. A, there is no indication that Gamaliel was a believer then or ever became one. No indication at all. He is not speaking as a undercover believer. He's not on his way to conversion. There, there's no indication. He's only mentioned one more time, and he's mentioned as Paul's mentor. So Paul, when his name was still Saul, was sat under this guy's teaching, and what Paul received from his teaching was, I need to go kill Christians, and I need to arrest them and make their life miserable, and they'll get the idea it's not worth it. So here's what we're doing. That's what Paul got from Gamaliel, who was his mentor, his teacher. There's no indication Gamaliel ever got saved or was ever interested in being saved. But in this situation, he saved their lives because they wanted to kill them. And he saved their ministry because it would have been harder to do when they were dead. Right? B, he basically said that if it was from God, they couldn't stop it. And if it wasn't from God, it would die off on his own. And in your notes, I said, sort of, kind of true, but not really. This is bad logic. I want to point out it's bad logic because I don't want you to go around thinking this way. This is bad logic, okay? It turned out to be good enough for the Sanhedrin, so they backed down at least for now. But why is it bad logic? Well, the Pharisees were a group of people that were against God, and they weren't dying down, okay? The Pharisees were exactly what he said couldn't happen. 
If it's not from God, we can't, it'll die off on its own. The Pharisees weren't dying off on their own. The Sadducees weren't dying off on their own. The Zealots weren't dying off on their own. There was factions all over Israel that were not representing God correctly, but thought they were representing God, and they weren't dying off on their own. Today, we have cults. We have the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, we have groups like that. There's, there's a ton of them. We have false churches, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Catholic Church, uh, apostate Protestant churches, mean, mean like churches that carry our name but don't teach the message. We have churches all over the world that are not teaching the gospel, that are not representing God. And some of them, frankly, are thriving. Some of their pastors are millionaires, and their buildings are worth billions. And, and from the outside, it looks awesome. And it looks like they are so successful. But the, God's not blessing them. The, the, the devil is funding them. The world is funding them. And so the logic doesn't work. Sometimes what God's in is a slow, painful process. Sometimes what God's in doesn't look successful on the outside. Sometimes it doesn't fit our criteria. Sometimes what God wants to do is, is the long haul, the long process. So his, his logic doesn't work, except right then and there. It worked for the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin, this guy stands up, gives his speech, and he goes, Hey, you know, if, if God's not in it, it's not going to work anyway. Let's just let him go. Flawed logic. And these guys were lawyers. Okay, Lawyers don't miss flawed logic, right? That's what they're paid to do. They argue over words. They argue over syllables in words. These are lawyers. What was their response? Oh, yeah, that's, that sounds good. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. That was their response. So it's another miracle from God that this happened. And here's the great part. See, this is a great example of God using an enemy to accomplish his will. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that kind of just excite you a little bit? God uses his enemies to accomplish his will. So that person out there doing exactly what God doesn't want him to do, the person who will not give God any credit for what he's doing, the person that hates God, God can even use them to accomplish his will. That false teacher out there, God can use him to accomplish his will. God is, God is not limited by what human beings can do. God accomplishes will through an enemy right in the enemy camp while his people were on trial. Today, God can use his enemies to accomplish his will. Sometimes when we get to see it happen, it's kind of funny. But he, he's, this happens all the time. And then D, rather than stoning, which is probably how they would have tried to kill them, they endured a flogging. Now, it's, it's good to know they missed a stoning because a flogging does not sound like fun. Now, we don't know who flogged them or how long it lasted or anything like that, but they were flogged. So 11, 12 guys, this, this large group of people that were preaching in the temple, they were flogged. I guarantee they left the room in pain. Okay? They didn't go, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can do that two or three more times. They, they left the room in pain, and the angel had told them, uh, go preach. Then they got flogged. And, and what did they do after that? They went and preached some more. Okay? Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching or proclaiming the good news. Okay? Rather than a stoning, they were flogged. They were saved by a Pharisee. Sixth detail, Acts 5.41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. We just read that. They were honored. The apostles were honored to suffer on behalf of Jesus. They were honored to suffer. You know, if we ever come to a spot where we're actually suffering directly for Christ, and, and we all suffer a little bit here and there all the time. Don't miss that. You're, you are suffering. You live in a world full of sin. You're suffering because of that. Every time you're overlooked or, or skipped because you're a person of faith and they don't want a person of faith around, you're, you're being persecuted a little bit. But one day it might come down to some real direct persecution. And I hope that when that day comes, you will consider it an honor to suffer for Christ. So in, in your notes, this is how I said it. A true believer deep down inside knows that suffering for Jesus is a great and honorable thing to endure. Something in me has this picture in my mind that one day they're going to come to the back door and they're going to come to arrest me because I'm a pastor who won't shut up. 
And they're going to walk in the back door to arrest me, and I'm not going to fight them. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go, maybe even with a smile on my face, because what an honor will it be to suffer a little bit for Christ. Now, here's the key. Some of you are saying to yourself, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could be flogged. I don't even think I could be arrested. I don't, I don't think I could lose my job. But you know, here's, here's B. It will only be possible by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside you. I'm not strong enough. I don't want to, I don't even want to sit in our county jail. I'm not strong enough. If, if we get lined up, which we've seen on, on the internet, we've seen on TV, we get lined up and there's a sword put to your neck and they say, how about now? Now? Now are you a Christian? Will you renounce your faith in Christ and walk away? Or will you claim your faith and lose your head right now? We're not strong enough to endure that. Please don't sit there and think you can handle that. But with the Holy Spirit, you're strong enough. We're going to get to Stephen pretty soon. Stephen was stoned. What does it say about him? He looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus at the right hand of God. And he said, he said forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Reminiscent of Jesus on the cross. That was not Stephen's strength. That was God's strength on display in Stephen. You will not be able to endure on your own. I guarantee it, because we're wimps, people. We're not that tough. But the Holy Spirit is strong. And the Holy Spirit will give you the strength you need. So if someone ever says to you, I don't think I can handle it, you go, well, you're right, you can't. But you will. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. That's how we are strong. That's how they were strong. That's how they took a beating and said, wow, are we honored or what? To have taken a beating because of the name of Christ. And let's get back on the job. That's the seventh detail, verse 42, which I also read already, but I'll read again. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news. A in your notes, now the teaching is described not only in the temple courts, but also in the houses. Did you catch that? We've increased. Before we were just in the temple, now we're in the houses. Now they've gone from evangelism to discipleship. They're in the houses teaching and preaching. B, God was using their suffering and their willingness to suffer and their faith in God's faithfulness and sovereignty to reach hundreds more people with the gospel. Hundreds of more people would be saved because the apostles are preaching and teaching. If you ever find yourself in a bind... Remember these two things. Based on this passage and others, when you're in a bind because of God, here's what God's going to do. He's going to do one of two things. He'll either provide a miracle. In this case, there were two miracles, getting out of jail and Gamaliel's speech that was listened to. Two miracles. Or he'll give you the strength to endure the pain, which is what he did with the flogging. If you don't get the miracle, you'll get the strength to endure Sometimes when you get the miracle, you'll still have to endure. But God says, you're doing what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you the strength to endure. I'm going to allow you a way to escape. And sometimes that way to escape means might mean, hey, you know what? Today's the day I get to go to heaven. Today's the day. It's all over. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. Just glory to God and experiencing things I've never experienced before. And we'll get there and we'll go, oh, that worked out well. Good deal. Right? I mean, that's, that's the worst man can do. Bring it on, right? He'll either give you a miracle of escape or he'll give you the miracle of endurance. And when it ends, when persecution ends, we get to the end of our trial, the end of our test, the end of the persecution. What we do is not go lick our wounds, take a siesta, have a break, say, wow, that was tough. I need some personal time now. We go right back to what we were doing that got us into trouble as long as it was God's plan. <laughs> we go right back to it. We go right back to preaching. We go right back to teaching. We go right back to living the way we're supposed to live. I, one little illustration. Just take a minute. I'm just going to throw it out there, and you think about it for a while. In, in, in the great building that we're in, great buildings that you've seen, maybe great buildings that you've built, we talk about the foundation. We talk about the structure of, of the framing 
We talk about the trusses. We talk about all these things. We rarely talk about the shingle. Shingle is a really small piece of something that goes on the roof. It takes an awful lot of shingles to cover a roof. Do you know what happens if you have a defective shingle or shingle that doesn't do its job? Everything else below it suffers. It rots, it gets wet, it becomes disformed and disfigured. The shingle is a very important part of the structure that doesn't get a lot of attention. And, and, and I haven't seen any like big uh, documentaries on the shingle. Folks, some of us are shingles. Some of us are shingles. And, and we're there to protect what's below us. And, and we're there to do a job. We may not get the glory. We may not ever be seen. But our job is real and it's important. You may only be one shingle, but you're part of God's building. You're part of, of, of the master structure that he's building called the church. We're all important. And, and, and you might take the weather and you might take the branch, and you may even have people throwing rocks and hitting you from below. But you can hold strong and do your part, and, and you're making a difference. What you're doing could produce hundreds and thousands of people becoming believers, and you will never know it because you're a shingle. You're not the front door. You're not the foundation. You're not the steeple. You're the shingle. So don't ever take lightly what you're called to do, or a way that you're suffering for Christ. Every piece has value. Every piece has a purpose. And, and you might be the, the nail underneath the flap of a shingle. But that nail underneath the flap of a shingle is very important. It's there for a reason. So let that illustration float around for a while. I think it will encourage you. Let's pray. Father. Thank you so much for being who you are, giving us this passage. Man, it was a long passage. We had a lot to talk about. Went over by a little bit, but that's okay. Bless our day. Let all this sink in. Change how we think. Change our knowledge of you in a, in a correct pattern. Help us to live better life, serving you in better ways. And Father, do your work in and through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.